So I have a guest tonight, Carol from CU Boulder, who has lots of experience uh, with cannabis and policy and advocacy, and also um, experience with the Drug Policy Alliance conference that just happened. So I'm gonna have Carol introduce herself yes. and then we'll go into some of the work you do. Yeah, thanks Marty, thanks for having me. My name is Carol Konzelman and um, I'm a senior anthropology instructor at the University of Colorado in Boulder. And uh, I've been a grad student and a teacher for 20 years at CU, and I was a high school biology, geology, math teacher before that. But um, I started working in Bolivia in, also 20 years ago in 1997 on the coca leaf and coca leaf growers and the impacts of the U.S. war on drugs. And it led me circuitously to looking at issues around cannabis and, and the broader picture of drug policy and reform. So for those that pe people that don't know, um, you have some engagement with youth groups or university groups that do mm -hmm. drug policy kind of work. So, yeah. And I know that might have been in the past. So tell us a little mm. bit about that and um, what you got out of it. Yeah. Well, I came in as an instructor with the residential academic programs at CU Boulder. It's a unique program that we have where if you're a freshman, you choose the dorm that you choose has an academic program as part of it. So I teach full time with the Global Studies academic program. And so the classrooms are in the dorm and our administrative offices and faculty offices are right there. And so part of my goal is really to be engaged with students and help them connect with the university. And so one thing that I've done is um, I was asked to be the faculty advisor for Students for Sensible Drug Policy, SSDP, which is an international organization that you know well. And because we wanted to collaborate, I was doing, teaching a course on drug policy and wanted to create a larger public event on cannabis uh, to overlap with 420 to really educate people about this topic. And so SSDP had similar goals. So we've been partnering ever since. And I also am sort of an informal advisor with the Psychedelic Club, which the first chapter was established at CU Boulder, and now there's several. Yeah, and I'm really grateful for the work you do because last year I went to one of the events, and that's yes. where I met you, and yes. it was just really inspiring and such a wonderful community of practice yeah. of people involved and engaged at different levels. Mm -hmm. So um, what I'm interested in is as an instructor connected to a university, mm -hmm. what kinds of things have you had to deal with about doing either cannabis-related work or work related to, to drugs in the classroom, like any either mm -hmm. stigma or problems or do you have to spend a lot of time trying to convince people like this is a legitimate area or has it been just a breeze for you? It's funny I have a lot of latitude teaching in the RAPs they're called residential academic programs because I'm not in the department formally um, and so I really get to create the courses that I want they have to coincide with course numbers but basically I design them how I want so I teach all kinds of cool stuff on immigration and democracy and the Andes and globalization and stuff like that. So uh, I've really had a lot of freedom to develop this course and I always incorporated something about coca leaf and cocaine and the U.S. war on drugs into all of those other courses until 2014 or looking towards spring 2014 when the University of Colorado had decided to close campus on 420 because of the history of what became known as the smoke out on 420 when up to about 12,000 people would convene on the CU Boulder campus on 420, you know, totally blocking up traffic all over town and it was real pain. And, and um, I saw this happening, you know, through graduate school and, um, and after that as an instructor, and I, every year I just thought, what a wasted opportunity. All these thousands of people coming together, all with similar interests on can cannabis, ostensibly to protest and to advocate for legalization. But there was no organized activity at these, at these smokeouts. It was just, oh yeah, let's get stoned on campus and raise some ruckus. So uh, I just thought, wow, you know, there should be some kind of organizing some kind of information, some kind of education. And so when I found out that CU was going to close campus for the third year in a row in 2014, I decided to create this semester long course on the anthropology of drugs and drug policy to look at the history of cultural uses, as I'm sure you know well. Also, I mean, almost every 
human culture has had some sort of psychoactive substance that they've used, whether it's an alcoholic bev beverage, some kind of stimulant, some kind of psychedelic, something to alter the consciousness. And some people think that intoxication is the fourth drive of, that ensures our survival, our very survival as human beings. So I developed this course because I wanted to organize some kind of public event around 420 and have my students help run it. And so it's interesting. So <laughs> I'm getting to your question, which is when, so we get into the class and I just, I use Andrew Weil to his book called From Chocolate to Morphine. And I assign that in week two, after we talk about what is anthropology, and I love using Wade Davis and Robert Gordon. And so week two we read uh, From Chocolate to Morphine, and what he says is drugs are here to stay, but all drugs are dangerous, no matter what drug you're talking about. Sugar, caffeine, nicotine, mm -hmm. alcohol, cocaine, heroin, whatever it is, they are dangerous and they need to be used with care. But the problem with our prohibition policies and the DARE programs is that it doesn't teach, especially young people, how to gain accurate information and how to think for themselves and make good decisions. Our policies treat people as if they're inherently bad, tending toward criminal behavior, and we need to rein them in and punish them for transgressions. And so I start with that framework, and I just say very clearly, I am not advocating any drug use because all drugs are dangerous. I would never advocate that you eat a pound of sugar every day. I would mm -hmm. never advocate that you smoke cigarettes. You know, I don't advocate any drug use, um, but nor do I, you know, I'm not going to entertain this kind of prohibition mindset where your choices can be subject to somebody else's morality. Right, no, amazing stuff. I appreciate what you, you shared. So, so many questions, because you're coming from Boulder, and in Denver, we're very Denver-centric with our weed industry, with everything else, mm -hmm. but you live in a different community. So what are some yeah. of the interesting similarities or differences but with Boulder in Denver's cannabis sector? It's interesting. It's, it seems like, this is really probably uneducated perspective, but just what I see is that it's, it's much more industrialized, the cannabis industry now in Denver. And I remember, you know, 20, 15, 20 years ago, that cannabis was saturated the town of Boulder. It just was underground. I think I remember somebody telling me that there were at least a thousand growers in Boulder, you know, 15, 20 years ago. So it was almost just like nothing really changed. It just came out of the shadows. Whereas in Denver, I really see, and there are elements of this in Boulder too, but you know, it's really driven the economy and so much immigration from around Colorado, around the country, I don't know, maybe around the world. People coming into Denver, it's totally revitalized the downtown, the warehouse district, and uh, you know, which has its positives and negative impacts. And so I see it in Boulder anyway, it's just kind of the norm. It's just, we don't have to sneak around. And, we, and instead of buying something that you're not sure where it came from, maybe it's a plant that was grown in Mexico and people died for to get it across the border, or maybe it was sprayed with Paraquat or whatever. You know, now if you're going to buy something, you know it's local, you know it's organic if you want it, you know maybe the family that grew it, and it's it really builds in the local economy. I think that's one of the best aspects. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. I hear terms like uh, boutique uh, dispensaries, yeah, like the new totally. term sort of gourmet and yeah. to differentiate and segment the market a, a right. bit. Uh, and so I'm fascinated because some of the things we struggle with as researchers, as parents, the perception that what we're doing, whether we're pro or con, but just generating discussion, like we're going to be harming kids or, or creating a platform where kids think it's okay. Yeah. So what would be like a representative conversation that you may have had with one of your kids or um, something that you think stands out with your you know, uh, relationship with, with, do you have one kid? Is it, I have one child, one yes. Child. Yeah, what would mm -hmm. be some conversation? Because uh, I, with my children, I'm just blown away how I'm very open about it, talking yeah. with them about it. And I heard my yeah. nine-year-old uh, last year, one of his friends was saying, oh, you know, so bad. And my nine-year-old was like, you know, marijuana is legal in Colorado and it was just so funny to have the, 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 the listen to him um, not that he's like saying hey let's go smoke a joint right but I'm just curious like you know anything you want to share with us about that well I think it's similar to how I present this material in my classroom which is just very matter-of-fact and that this is a topic worthy of academic research and inquiry and 
um, that it, it that the discipline of anthropology is so well suited to studying cannabis and any other psychoactive psycho, psychoactive substance where you have to consider the historical and the cultural context and to talk to people who are the users and producers and sellers and whoever all the different nodes of that commodity chain and um, and to value those perspectives and not just have this top-down view again this moralizing perspective this ethnocentric perspective which is what our policies are obviously based on and um, so I present that same kind of attitude with my daughter and she's in third grade now and she's been familiar with cannabis for many years because I helped organize three annual cannabis symposia which you attended in 2016 and so she's been familiar with this concept and I'm just very matter of fact she knows Brigitte Mars and I've invited Brigitte Mars to come to my class and speak and she's seen her talk about cannabis as well and it's just it's normal and in fact today we were having dinner and my daughter's doing a research project on ancient Egypt and her task is to study medicine and, and healing and uh, Greece sorry ancient Greece medicine and healing and she said to me matter of fact she said guess what I was doing research today and I found out that cannabis was used by the ancient Greeks oh as God, healing medicine. And I was like, that's so cool. I wow. said, really? And she's like, didn't you know that already? I said, well, yeah, I did know that. But that's awesome that you found that out. Oh, X is so cute. Yeah. And, and I want to tell one other story because it also relates to your other question about kind of difficult conversations at the university. And that is that when I was planning the first, I called it a 420 teach-in again, to try to, to change the paradigm of the 420 smokeout and really treat it as a legitimate topic for inquiry and discussion in, at a university. And so I decided that I wanted to invite the chancellor, Phil DiStefano, to come to my class because I felt like these decisions were being made from on high mm -hmm. and that both sides were demonizing each other. I wanted to bring the chancellor in face to face with students so students could directly ask questions so that he wasn't some mean ogre, but also for him to hear directly from students to try to humanize you know, the student body and understand their perspective. And so I sent an email and I'd CC'd my director and I saw him in the hallway the next day. He's like, oh yeah, you think the chancellor is gonna come to your class? I said, well, he certainly won't if I don't invite him. And Sure enough, he said yes, and that's partly was the incentive to say, oh my God, the chancellor's coming. I'm going to make a bigger event. So instead of just a classroom visit, we turned it into the first kind of public um, event to make it open to both uh, students and faculty and staff and the public. And we went on KGNU and Radio 1190 and Daily Camera and tried to bring in a lot of publicity. And still, you know, we had to really be clear in our materials and the way we introduce the topic because the students were doing presentations at the event to be again just that no one's advocating for use and especially legalization does not imply advocacy it just is a, the best way to address the harms that have been created both by abuse and addiction but also by drug prohibition and the methods we've chosen so I guess um, that was a really turning, a turning point for me. The chancellor saying yes, that he was willing to engage in this topic and put his name behind this, this event where we would discuss this publicly. And he came the next year when we turned it into a big all day full fledged event with SSDP. Um, I invited him to be the opening plenary speaker and he said yes. So I really felt strongly about positioning that not as an act of protest and resistance, even though it kind of was, you know, just because it's bringing it out of the shadows, but also to say we are collaborating with the administration here and, uh, and faculty and staff, so. Well, let me just share with people, the chancellor and regents are like the CEOs of the University of Colorado right. system. And they're extremely important in terms of being gatekeepers to yeah. what we can or can't do in uh, the University of Colorado. So what a great right. story. And I would love to talk with you and others over the long term of maybe doing some innovative presentations to the regions to say that we mm. should be able to do um, evidence-based policy influential research that, mm -hmm. that could bring greater visibility to the University of Colorado. 
Yeah. Only because I think the University of Colorado, with its current position of being a little bit maybe um, not certain about what it wants to do, it's preventing some really good research being done mm -hmm. because of the fact they don't want to lose the, the funding from the federal government in the Schedule One, which I recognize. But I think we have work yeah. to do to educate all sides yeah. about um, some innovations we can do. Um, we have a, a couple more minutes. I wanted to ask you about as a researcher, what would be like a dream project that you think you'd like to do or you think that needs to be done and, and why? Um, well, <laughs> I'm not sure because I actually, I'm more of a teacher. I've kind of taken the pedagogical route. So I can speak to that. I helped to organize, you mentioned the International Drug Policy Reform Conference, organized by the Drug Policy Alliance. It's every other year in different locations and this is my fourth time attending. And the first time that they let me organize a session on, I called it critical drug pedagogy. And so what I wanted to do was to show that this was a topic that had a lot of interest because what I saw year after year going to this conference and many others is that, you know, we need to think critically and consciously about what do we do with all this information that we're collecting and all the different perspectives that that kind of event provides, how do we go and then educate our students or our patients or the public or policymakers on these topics? And so I organized this session with, uh, we had eight people on this panel, it was only an hour, but I just wanted to pack in as many different perspectives and it was the largest attended community session of the weekend. And basically what that showed was, okay, this is a legitimate topic and so the next conference I'm hoping to organize a big formal panel that will be on the schedule and we can really have you know, audiovisual and really take it to that next level to really think about how we're doing this. And, and I would say to continue on this path at CU, um, inviting the chancellor to that event and having his kind of stamp of approval also gave him the kind of ability to open campus the next year because there was finally an alternative not just the smoke out and we had demonstrated for two years that, that was, it did not devolve into a smoke out event and that we could maintain a professional atmosphere and so since then last year we did a psychedelic carnival we're sort of integrating more playful elements to bring youth young people together and then you can talk about the hard stuff and so this spring we're also doing an event on april 12th is the tentative date and it's uh, SSDP and the CU Boulder Psych uh, and the Psychedelic Club of Boulder will be hosting an educational symposium on the topic of psychoactive drugs, the social, cultural, and legal dynamics surrounding psychoactive drugs, and how the dynamics around these substances are changing. So tentatively planned for 412, um, so in advance of 420, so people are already armed with information, on the CU Boulder main campus. And um, the talks will feature a diverse array of harm reductionists, drug policy reformers, and leaders in community and state drug policy and health uh, and researchers, et cetera. So I guess that's where I see myself. And I would like to continue to help create these events on campus and develop these models that can be adapted around the country on university campuses, especially public universities. I would like to revive the national teach-in mm -hmm. that you know was created in the 60s to bring students and faculty and the public together to debate on critical topics of public importance that were not being adequately addressed by our elected representatives. And I, obviously drugs and drug policy is one of those. So just because I want to make sure people get it, one more time, yeah. say the name of the event, the date, and what kind of people do you want? To, is it free? Does it cost it's money? It's free, no. It would, be, it would be in the similar fashion that we've had before. So this will be, we don't have a location yet, but somewhere like the UMC, probably, you know, large spaces open to the public. We will definitely have a lot of media coverage beforehand so that you can, people can find, easily find out about it. Um, definitely open to the public. And if you're interested in participating, I would say get in touch with the SSDP chapter at CU Boulder, which you can easily find online, or myself, Caroline Konzelman at Colorado.edu. And one more time, just so people get it, what is the SSDP? S Students for Sensible Drug Policy. Their headquarters are in Washington, D.C., and they have, they're the most active 
organization for young people and for students. You do not have to be a university student to be a member of the group. You do have to be a student to be an officer. And there, the idea there is that they, addressed issue, they address issues of local concern to their particular university and their student body and the community. And so they do harm reduction activities. They organize small events. They'll bring in speakers. And they also advocate for different policies at the university and the community state and level. And so like SSDP was involved in Amendment 64, for example, collecting signatures and helping to raise awareness. So no, what's so important is the link with the university work being based there, but also there's linkages to community work. Because that's right. I think we have a problem in the university where we're sort of up in the ivory tower and we're always searching for that bit, big link and, yeah. and to make it sustainable. Yeah, so and we, it's that applied work exactly. that your previous guest was talking about. How do you take what you're learning in a textbook in the classroom and really look at the real world? And that's how I see, you know, my class is being very applied and, and So let's say, because I want us to be helpful for people, let's say there's someone in California or Michigan or wherever, they want to do something like what you're doing. So yeah. what have you learned in terms of organizing the events and what would be a few things just to be careful of to ensure your time efficient and you overcome whatever obstacles are required to make the event happen? Oh, man, it all comes down to advertising, doesn't it? I mean, you can spend a year organizing an event and if people don't know about it, nobody comes and that's been that's always the toughest part that I that of my experience in any kind of event that I've organized but um, but so delegation is really good so like to have somebody from the very beginning their responsibility from the beginning of this the discussion of the event itself is media you know social media print media radio and other TV media whatever media is available of course, Denver Open Media and KGNU are great sources locally here in Colorado. But uh, you know, somebody who can really get that momentum going even before you have all the details lined out. I think that that was that has been the biggest challenge. You know, because we're all so focused on just what are the sessions going to be and who are we going to invite and who's got what, and it's just this controlled chaos. And then all of a sudden, two weeks before, we're like, okay, now that we have it. We got to get the flyer made and we got and then it's almost too late. So um, also the timing, sadly, the event that we held that, that you attended that was on 420, which we thought was our big goal for the previous three years was to have it on 420. It'll be amazing and people will be walking through in the student union and we had rented out the biggest spaces. And it turns out now that there's no smoke out and now that weed is legal, no one wants to be on campus <laughs> anymore. So that was kind of a bust, but um, it still was a, an important event. And I think the other thing is figuring out live streaming. And so the first, I guess it was the second year that we did the symposium and it was in the law school. That turned out to be a great place because they have live streaming built in. That to help, it helps. 15 <laughs> minutes after each session, they were emailed me a YouTube file of every <laughs> event. So that was amazing. Because the year that it was in the student union, we were scrambling, trying to find somebody, and then the sound didn't work. And then the, so yeah. those would be the main things. Otherwise, it's just fun to try to get a, a diversity of opinions and perspectives and you know, the law community and government and business and advocacy and, you know, in terms of cannabis, you know, looking at the plant itself and the ancient history and cultural uses and medicine and therapy, therapeutic applications and law enforcement and legislative challenges and, you know, business climate and sustainability, all that stuff. It's so fun to be able, because there's just a limitless, you know, number of perspectives on this and, and it's, that's what makes it so interesting. Yeah. You know, it's inherently interdisciplinary for my students that's the other thing that I say to them is you know this topic can apply to any major so one thing we do at the very beginning is you say what your major is and how that might relate and at the end of class we have that same conversation and people see like oh wow I could really study this and then I hear all of my students are first-year students so I hear from them for their next three years because they're like Oh my God, I love we talk, what we talked about and have to do a paper for some other class or a thesis or study abroad. And so it really does become incorporated into their worldview. Well, let me ask you more about your class, um, uh, the drug po anthropology of drug policy. Yeah. So um, when you teach it again, is there something you would, be, you would do differently because how students are changing or their interests are, are being adjusted? Like mm. what, what innovation would you do? Or if someone sat in, what would they 
What were the experience? Hmm. You know, there's never enough time. I wish I could do, I could teach five years worth of material <laughs> just from, you know, the stuff that I even know about. But so it would be nice to, to mix it up. I, you know, opioids is something that has, wasn't built into the structure of this course, but obviously this semester especially, we've really built it into, you know, I've had extra articles that I've assigned and I had one group present on that. And so um, I think just kind of keeping up with the times, or at least what I do is I add in student presentations both throughout the course and then as uh, this sort of symposium so that they can build in their own interests and mm -hmm. current events. I also give extra credit for them attending and writing a response paper on any event, and there's so much going on, or um, I bring in guest speakers all the time, so I guess that's one that's one way that I that I try to incorporate that. Have you tried field trips, like any visits to places? Well, I'm not 21, so I'm really stymied. But I'll tell you what I do. I, I also teach a summer study abroad course in Bolivia. So I've been working in Bolivia also since 97. And so I designed this course in 2011. And uh, about every other year now, I have a group of 10 or 12 students mostly from CU and from all different majors. And they come with me to Bolivia. It's just two and a half weeks. But it's enough for them to get the ethnographic experience. It's basically my year and a half of ethnographic field work condensed into two and a yeah. half weeks. You know, they just do a little bit of everything. It's a completely structured experience. But they each get to choose what topic they're looking at based on their major or their interests or career aspirations and so um, I just kind of act as this facilitator and they each have to be opportunistic every day is we're all doing the same thing together whether it's picking coffee or picking coca leaf or visiting a shaman or hiking to the top of the mountain for a ceremony or visiting the Africa Afro Bolivian community or meeting with the mayor you know all these different things but they're each looking at it through their own lens. Are they, are they interested in gender and the role that women play in these multiple ways? Or um, are they interested in what rural development is and NGOs or international organizations? Are they interested in like Evo Morales and um, national policy and how that's reflected locally or the US war on drugs? And a lot of them, because coca leaf is also one of those super interesting subjects like cannabis is as this ancient medicinal plant. In mm -hmm. fact, the two of them probably are the oldest domesticated plants in the, on the planet. They're both, they both go back about 10,000 years. And so a lot of them will cover those topics. So that's another way to do it, especially those can be older students. And then you really, yeah, you get the hands on. Well, it sounds like a great course. All the <laughs> courses you're teaching, it is so helpful for me to hear you talk because as I structure and implement, implement my courses, just thinking, you know, what works well and what mm -hmm. works getting students engaged to sort of run with things in yeah. ways that we wouldn't even have thought about. Right. Uh, we're running out of time, so let me thank you, Carol. Yeah, thanks, um, Marty. You've been watching Getting High on Anthropology. I'm Marty Otania, the host. You can find us at www.fsandgreen.org. Thanks for tuning in tonight and have a great day.